Welcome back to the Small College Basketball Podcast. My name is Chris Cottrell, and with more than 10 years of small college basketball coaching experience and entering our third season of full coverage here on the Small College Basketball Podcast, this is the only podcast with interviews, news, and highlights that celebrates the incredible coaches, players, and programs across all of small college basketball, celebrating NCAA Division II, NCAA Division III, the NAIA, the NCCAA, and the USCAA. Small College Basketball would like to thank Visit Central Florida for their support of the podcast and the Small College Basketball Hall of Fame Classic. Start planning your Central Florida vacation now at visitcentralflorida.com. That's visitcentralflorida.com. Welcome back to the Small College Basketball Podcast. My name is Chris Cottrell. Once again, celebrating the players, the coaches, the programs, and the history of small college basketball. Do want to take a moment to thank Visit Central Florida for their support of the Small College Basketball Podcast and the Small College Basketball Hall of Fame Classic coming up. Plan your Central Florida vacation now at visitcentralflorida.com. Visitcentralflorida.com. And speaking of Central Florida, we're sitting here tonight joined by the godfather of small college basketball, John McCarthy, uh, the founder of small college basketball, and my good friend, John McCarthy. This is our first video together. So we're, we're working, we're working out the kinks as we go. Yeah. And we are each trying to figure out what background to put for that matter. We haven't had a deal with this before. This is fantastic. I, I love your background. Dr. Naismith would be proud to see his, uh, the backboard, the rim, the court, uh, all over the world. Good stuff. Yeah, it's terrific. And, and speaking of Central Florida, I hope you're warm wherever you are. Oh, I am. I'm good to go. I'm in <laughs> Southwest Florida. Uh, I am able to walk out my uh, my slides out to take the dogs for a walk or to go down to the uh, the pool. I got a pretty good pretty good circumstance right now. It's beautiful out. You got it. Well, we got we got a, a short time frame to work this in, John. But we're so excited to do it especially considering we're on the cusp of the small college basketball season. You know, you and I talk consistently, and this is probably our, our favorite time of year, even before the season gets going. And, you know, we've got some irons in the fire and, and we are getting ready to announce, I said, Jay, you are getting ready to announce and open up the tribute to small college basketball. It's going to open on Saturday, October 14th. I know you're excited to have it set at Hyvee Arena in Kansas City. It's going to be open to the public, no cost at all. Um, this is a tribute, a living tribute to small college basketball. So for the listeners who are unaware, NCAA Division II, NCAA Division III, NAIA basketball, NCCAA basketball, and then the USCAA. So we've got small college basketball going to be going to going to come alive in Kansas City. John, this has been a pet project for a while. I know you're excited talk to, to, to talk to us about this. Yeah, obviously we've been working on this literally for years uh to raise the money and to bring the fruition uh this vision if you will to life. And I I'll, I'll just give you one snippet of a phrase I heard earlier. I got an email from my friend Roy Pickerel who will be there to speak, lifetime achievement award winner small college basketball in the past, absolute basketball junkie. He sent a note to me saying, ladies and gentlemen, Christmas has been moved to October 14th this year for the grand opening of the tribute to small college basketball. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful day. Uh, the, what we're really trying to do, this is going to be living and breathing is probably the wrong term, term but it's going to be constantly evolving because we're using so much technology. We're going to have four touch screens on the inside along with a wrap of the timeline of small college basketball. And then with those touch screens, if you want to see any of the speeches of any of the Hall of Famers we've inducted that have been there, you just click, click, click on any of them that we've we've had in person. There'll be videos about every other Hall of Famer you can watch. You can go to the next screen then and see any of our award winners. Bevo Francis Award winner, Larry Smith Award winner, Harry Statham Coach of Impact Award winner, the Lifetime Achievement Award winner, and click and watch the videos about any of those winners. 
And then you go to the next screen, you've got, there's been four coaches in the history of small college basketball to ever win a thousand games. I've been very fortunate to happen to know all of them personally. So we've asked each of them to create a video on what was it like to win your thousandth game? What was that day like? You can click on the video, learn the bio about them, watch their video talking about that. And then the fourth screen is about the stories, which will continue to evolve. If you want to hear about Trevor Hudgens sitting down in a chair talking about his career, if you want to listen to Jerry Sloan talking about his career, and on and on. We've got so many great, uh, great stories on there. The big screen, four screens put together, we've got a lengthy video by design, lengthy. So when you walk in at different times, you'll see different parts of that video. Whether you want to see the great highlights of uh, Barton's incredible win in the national championship in 2007 with Anthony Atkinson scoring 10 straight points to win the national title, or you want to see Graceland shot in overtime to win the national title in, in the NAI, and on and on. Sit down with Don Meyer at one point, a wonderful piece just before he passed away, to great footage of Bevo Francis when he played in the early 1950s. We got it on the big screen. We've got a light projection that will go every minute will tell you about a new, a different player, coach, contributor. You want to see Earl of Pearl Monroe and John Wooden and James Naismith and so on. We've got a few physical pieces that are going to be awesome. The diary that, uh, that Clarence Walker kept in the late 1940s when he played for Coach John Wooden, when he, when he was the first black player to ever play in a national championship game in America, he kept a diary that year and the family gave it to me. It's going to display that piece and quite a few others. On the outside screen, you'll see the scrolling of every few seconds, the national championship, their national championship teams currently, Division II, III, NAI, National Coaches of the Year, National Players of the Year, uh, photo collages all over the place. I'm biased, Chris. This is going to be awesome. And and it's at High V Arena. About how big is the footprint of the space? Yeah, so... Just as a perspective, for those that are listening that aren't in Kansas City, uh, please note hy Arena was formerly known as Kemper Arena. The 1988 Final Four, Danny and the Miracles winning the national championship over Oklahoma was played there, for example. It's a massive arena that a guy named Steve Fausch came and bought for $1.00. Uh, literally one dollar he paid for it the city was gonna have to pay millions to knock it down now he's put tens of millions into it it's a youth sports mecca today so we expect easily tens of thousands of people coming through on an annual basis we're not charging anything as you mentioned at the beginning and so the footprint it's going to be roughly 12 14 feet tall we've got an old scoreboard that's 60 70 years old we're going to display within there um, we're going to have the, it looks like hardwood on, on the inside. It's going to be a round piece. We'll probably be able to hold, I'd say, 30 or 40 people at a time going through there. But there's some displays on the outside as well. And we have room for enhancement on the video pieces and some areas we can enhance going forward as long as we're able to continue to raise money uh, to do that. So uh, we probably fit 30 to 40 people in at a time. And we realize it's going to be an evolution of people rotating through on a regular basis. So, so a terrific tribute to all of the levels, all the history of small college basketball. If, if listeners want to see renderings, they can go to smallcollegebasketball.com. There are pictures of the progress on Twitter. I know that we've been posting on Twitter. There are renderings of what we hope to have open on October 14th. I mean, John, how many years in the works has this been for you? Uh, we have started talking about that as at least three or four years ago, began to raise the money and then start the vision of what do we, what would we want that to look like if we had the money? Well, now we have the money. And so we've been spending a lot of time. It's literally been three or four years and pretty seriously the last two years in putting this together. And just as a note, for those that are in the area or even if you're a little further away, we're going to start at four o'clock central time uh, with the grand opening on that day. And, and we've had a, a bit of interest of people saying, well, who's going to be there? Who's going to speak? And I just I just put that out. I believe it was this morning or yesterday. So you're aware the owner of the company that's building it called Exhibit Associates named Don Jalbert is going to talk about what it's taken to build this physical piece. 
the general manager of High V Arena, Chris Coffin, is going to speak. And then Roy Pickerel, who won our Lifetime Achievement Award, is about in every other Hall of Fame known to mankind in the sports information world or in Division II basketball, is going to speak after that. And then Daryl Jones, who went into our Hall of Fame last year, four-time All-American, NAI All-American from um, from Atchison, Kansas, when he played at Benedictine, won the national championship. He's going to speak. And then we're very fortunate. Roger Kaiser is coming in from Georgia, won three national titles as the head coach at Life University. And before that, 1974, Coach Foots Walker in West Georgia, the national championship. So only four national championships as a head coach for him. Uh, Darnell Kirkwood used to play for us at Lynn University when I was there. He's going to fly back from Los Angeles to be there. He's been an actor, a model, an artist. Just as a note, as an actor, um, he's been he's been in the number one light, uh, daytime show with uh, Young and the Restless. And then he was uh, in Top Gun Maverick with Tom Cruise. And his billboard's been in Times Square in New York. I'm just excited to spend some time with Darnell. He'll be back to talk about what college basketball meant to him. He played college basketball at Lynn University and went on to play professional for a couple of years. And then, of course, Coach Harry Statham will speak. And uh, Coach Statham was the first coach in the history of college basketball to win 1,000 games. And quite frankly, it'll become pretty apparent that day uh, to a great extent. This is the house that Harry and Rose built because they are the largest contributors financially to this project. We are incredibly grateful. Uh, this project at this point doesn't happen without them. Uh, they've invested greatly in, team, in, uh, in what we've done here with Small College Basketball and our foundation. Terrific, uh, terrific news. Really, ex I mean, exciting news. I wish I could get there. I can't. Probably warmer than here. But uh, I wish I could get there, but I can't. Um, so with this opening October 14th, the season literally is now around the corner. And we talk all the time about what's coming up. And the big event that kicks off the small college basketball season is really in Lakeland, Florida, with the Small College Basketball Hall of Fame induction ceremony and then the Small College Basketball Hall of Fame Classic. So real quick, uh, I know we've got the seventh class going in uh, this year to the Small College Basketball Hall of Fame. Um, who, who's in the class this year, John? Um, listeners, again, can go to smallcollegebasketball.com to, to do more reading and research. But who's in the class this year? A really loaded field. Yeah, and each year, I think some people um, uh, may not realize how uh, accomplished you need to be. As you mentioned, this is just the seventh class. So even after this class is inducted, we're still under 100 players, coaches, contributors, collectively, that have inducted into the Hall of Fame over the course of the history of all of Division II, three, NAI, NCCA, USCAA, et cetera. So out of the I don't know the number, at least hundreds of thousands of people that have coached, played, contributed to small college basketball. We're still under 100. So to get into this Hall of Fame, it's elite of the elite. And to just run down this quickly, and I think you hit the nail on the head, for those that want to know some of the details about the, the bios of these people, the accomplishments of these people, please go to smallcollegebasketball.com, click on the Hall of Fame section. We have the front page of it. We'll tell you about this year's class, and you can click through year after year. But this year's class, from a player's standpoint, we have 10 players, one coach, and one contributor this year. The 10 players are Frankie Allen, Gerald Cunningham, Bayard Forrest, Greg Grant, John Grokowalski, Ch Charles Hardnett, Henry Lee Logan, Jackie Moreland, R.C. Owens, and Glenn Roberts. The coach is Coach Joe Hutton from Hamline University, and the contributor was also is Ed Steets. And uh, we are so excited about this year's class. When we announced the class, six were living, six were deceased. Uh, very sadly, unfortunately, Henry Lee Logan, who is an icon in college basketball, especially in the South, uh, the, what he's prim primarily known as the first black player uh, at a non-HBCU in the uh, in the South in college basketball, and was a phenomenal player. Went on to play professional basketball for quite some time. I did speak with him, let him know about his induction. He was thrilled, and very shortly thereafter. Uh, one of his good friends called me crying, let me know that Henry had just passed away a few hours before. Uh, so at this point, all five living members 
will be there in person. That's Frankie Allen, Gerald Cunningham, Bayard Forrest, Greg Grant, and John Grakulowski will all be there in person, all living members this year. Uh, please go to the website, check out the bios, incredible accomplishments for every single member of this class. Uh, frankly, I'm pumped. It's going to be a great year. Yeah, and, and the the backside of that is the Small College Basketball Hall of Fame Classic being played at Florida Southern University for the second year in a row, uh, November 4th and November 5th. Terrific lineup. I mean, we, we go into this every year saying, what a terrific lineup, John. You've put a great field together. But this year, once again, uh, Colorado School of the Mines, Bentley, Cedarville, uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis, Central Oklahoma, Mercyhurst, Virginia Union, Emporia State, UNC Pembroke, and, and the host school, Florida Southern. Just a full slate of games both days. So if, if you're into watching good basketball, you can't beat this event. Um, and if you're into celebrating good basketball, this event is a culmination of what small college basketball is really all about. We have the Champions Classic, of course, but this is the kickoff. This is the Hall of Fame induction ceremony. This is the this is the bookend to it. What are you excited for this year at Florida Southern, John? Uh, well, the tip off the college basketball to begin with. And if you're a basketball junkie and enjoy it like we do, the reality is to sit there to watch 10 games in two days with very high level basketball that should be incredibly competitive. Uh, literally every game on paper should be really competitive. And, and one thing we did this year, Chris, is we looked at this uh, and realized Florida Southern's the host, as we talked about, we decided to invite nine teams that had never played in it in the past, since we've started this event. We wanted to give new teams, new conferences, new teams, new regions, et cetera, an opportunity to play in a national event that's exempted by the Division II Conference Commissioners. And a little shout out to the Division II Conference Commissioners, huge gratitude for the, uh, for the exemption to this wonderful event. So we're able to play a week before everybody else in Division II basketball, and we're able, the games count in every way except against their limits. So in essence, all these teams get a couple extra games. So we have nine teams that have never had the opportunity to play in this before that are all really darn good, some well-coached teams, really high-level basketball. Uh, and it's neat to hear the coaches' enthusiasm uh, for the opportunity to play in this. And heck, Chris, you, we talked about having a conversation here. You sat courtside last year for the whole darn thing. What'd you think? I thought I'm biased, of course, uh, by inviting the teams. But uh, I, I'd imagine you'd enjoy it. You're a basketball junkie. This is this is good stuff. Loved every moment of it last year. Got to sit there with Rob Gardner, uh, who's now coaching. And, and we just talked about how high of a level yeah. that each team competes at. And, and not just the team, but then you look at the individuals. I mean, you look at what Nova Southeastern did. We saw them in the first game of the year last year. And we saw them again in the last game of the year, 36 and 0, undefeated national champions. So to see the progression of, of a team like Nova Southeastern. But then you look at this year's matchups. What I think is really cool about this year is like you've got you've got Mercyhurst and Central Oklahoma. That's, in I what world does that matchup happen except for the small college basketball hall of fame classic? Because that's a, you know, that that's that's a that's a final four matchup the way yeah. that the season is structured. So I think the matchups are, are going to be a lot of fun. A lot of, you know, Emporia State Pembroke is another one that stands out to me just because of the quality uh, and the sustained success those programs have had specifically the last two years, three years. Well, and, and, and you look, you hit the nail on the head with some, first of all, I think they're all going to be good, but I, I think you just highlighted two really good ones, by the way. You and know, Colorado one, School of Mines Bentley, you talk about high, high achievers, high achievers, high achievers. Oh. I mean, they're way smarter than us, all those kids. Oh, 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 yeah. I mean, we're talking about like elite, elite academic yes. uh, schools. And in this particular case that are ridiculously well coached, are so disciplined and can play. You know, one of the things that would be enjoyable, and I'd highly encourage high school basketball coaches, players, parents to come and sit and watch Mercyhurst play Central Oklahoma and really think, 
about how good you have to be to go against that Mercyhurst defense uh, and how good you have to be to get on the court at Central Oklahoma. I mean, th this is high level, but this isn't, hey, I was all conference in high school, so I'm going to go start for Central Oklahoma, uh, or I'm going to be able to step on the court at Mercyhurst. These guys are really, really talented, compete incredibly hard. Um, you're right. I mean, that that could be an Elite Eight or Final Four matchup uh, right there. And I, I will tell you, Emporia State is really talented. Uh, one of the things Craig Doty commented on, I thought he was really observant. And one of the things that we've we've noted is not only how good a team was last year or the year before, but what's that roster going to look like next year? And so we knew, for example, Emporia State was darn good playing in the MIAA, finishing the top, I believe, four in the MIAA, going to the NCAA tournament, winning a game in the NCAA tournament. But what you look at is who's coming back. Now with the transfer portal, that things get a little bit mucky at times uh, on who may leave. But knowing that on paper, they had just about their whole team back, uh, with the exception of one or two. But the crux, crux of their team was all coming back. And here's a team they played in the second round of the NCAA tournament. Same thing, you look at a Central Oklahoma. They're a team that was really good last year, moved into the top 10 in the country. But you look and say, gosh, a core of that team is back. They've got five guys on Central Oklahoma that all saw time starting last year. They didn't all start at the same time the entire season, but they had four, five guys that all started at one time or another last year back at Central Oklahoma, they're going to be really darn good. So this is going to be fun. And by the way, the host, uh, with Jaden Booth coming back, Jaden Booth was the MVP of the whole event last year as a, as a sophomore. So he's coming back for his junior season this year. And Florida Southern, if you recall, ended up going 2-0 and last year, including beating West Texas A&M uh, last year. So Florida Southern's going to be awfully darn good as the host school. So, you know, we could talk about every single individual school, but I just say, suffice to say, come on out and watch these games in person. If you're not able to be there on person, by design, we're live streaming everything for free through the internet, through the Florida Southern website, Sunshine State Conference Network. There's no cost. Check it out. Check out these games. As you mentioned at the beginning, this is really high-level basketball. And and you mentioned how good you have to be to get on the floor. Like, you got to be really good to get on the floor. But how hard do you have to play to actually compete at that level? I think that is that is now the hardest thing to translate um, as we see, you know, the, the portal. We see NIL changing the landscape of who's being recruited and who's playing where. You, you got to be a level above where you're going the next year as a high school senior if you're going to stay. You know, you made, a, you made a comment last year, Chris, when we were watching Northwest Missouri State, if I recall, about the, and the year before, for that matter, about defensively, how good and how consistent you, you were remarking a little bit about Diego Bernard at, at one point. But but mm -hmm. collectively, as a whole team, I think you made a similar comment about every possession, how hard they play defensively. Now, they're not the only ones, clearly, but the consistency and the unbelievable effort. I think what some people coming out of high school deem playing hard is different than maybe what Northwest Missouri State, what you see when you're up close watching that consistent, unbelievable effort defensively. I think suffice to say, and I realize Northwest is not in this this year, they're playing in the, in the Champions Classic this year, but suffice to say, for you to get on the court at Northwest Missouri State, you're gonna play defense or you're not gonna play. For the most part, I, I think that's that's how it is. If you look in the top twenty-five, top fifty teams, yeah, you, you, I mean, especially in a league like the MIAA or a lead like a league like the South Atlantic Conference, you've got to be able to defend because all those guys can score. <laughs> Everybody can score. So, uh, I think I think we're going to see a ton of good basketball, a ton of really good players, and I'm looking selfishly looking forward to some warmer weather myself. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm confident you'll get that. Coming from uh, upstate New York uh, to central Florida to Polk County uh, during that time of the year in November, I don't have much doubt it's going to be warmer than it is in upstate New York.
So, John, I'm going to throw one more question at you. This was off the script, and we only got about four minutes left. Why does co small college basketball mean so much to you? For the people that haven't listened before, that, that maybe just think this guy's crazy, he loves basketball, why does it mean so much to you? Well, you're right. That's off script. We didn't talk about that one ahead of time. You, you know what I think a good part of it is, is I've lived it as assistant coach, as head coach, um, as running the NAI tournament, of being on the Division II committee. I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with fellow coaches, uh, student athletes, and, and I've, I've learned a lot of the personal stories of the coaches, uh, the student athletes. At times, I get to see the struggles, if you will, at times, and what this means to so many young people in a lot of ways, working their way out of either uh, poverty at some points, having the opportunity to get an education where they may not have otherwise. But I think it's the human stories uh, that really resonate with me, uh, along with the fact the reality is I'm a history major, I'm a basketball junkie. And if you combine that, uh, the great history of our game, there's been so many great people, so many great stories are out there. I, I want to make sure that we're able to tell those stories to the next generation so they can appreciate the history of our game. Uh, but mostly, Chris, I think it's I think it's the people I had the chance to meet so many wonderful people through this game that have become some of my best friends uh, through this game. Uh, it's very, very heartfelt. I think it's safe to say this is a passion. I have another full time job. Uh, this is a this is clearly a passion. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about the people, it's about the history, and um, I don't know, this is pretty heartfelt, this uh, this this whole creation, and uh, I thanks for giving the opportunity with that question. I really wasn't expecting that, um, but it becomes almost emotional at times because it's, uh, uh, I put so much time and effort uh, into telling other people's stories with great passion, um, but boy, I love people and I love this game. Well, that sums up, you know, your vision for small college basketball. I think the way that you told that, that, that story and your feelings. And I'll never forget, I was coaching at Davis and Elkins and we had just won a really close game and we were out to dinner. My family had come down to visit and my high school coach was there, a very close friend of ours. He said, gosh, you know, Duke and Carolina are playing tonight, but that game doesn't matter to anybody that was in that gym earlier. And it's, you know, that it's the same way as a high school coach, our high school players, like every game is so important to the people that are there and that are invested in it. It doesn't matter what other game is on. Yeah. And, and I felt that like, gosh, like this is really like division two, you know, NCCAA, USCAA winning the national championship is really important. It's really special whatever level you do it at, and you do it because you want to impact people, like you said, I, I, I mean, it's the people, it's the relationships. And, mm -hmm. and that's why we do it. It's all important to us. You know, um, and you've seen what I'm about to say, and I know we're up against the clock, um, but you've seen the emotion of mm -hmm. people. You've seen the parents in the stands crying. Um, you've seen at the end of these games, uh, the emotion, the people hugging and crying um, because it means so much to them when you put in that much time and effort. And, and frankly, in a, in a lot of cases, at the levels we're dealing at, very much under the radar. We're, yes. not, we're, we're not selling out typically the Carrier Dome. We're not selling out Cameron Indoor Stadium or Fog Allen Fieldhouse. Uh, whether there's 50 people in the stands or 5,000 people in the stands, you know, as you mentioned, this means something to people, to those parents, those student athletes that have worked from the time they're a little kid uh, all the way to the opportunity to play college basketball. And when they hit that last second shot, when their team wins that, that buzzer beater, when they win that conference championship, that regional, that national championship, boy, I'll tell you what. That you've seen it, that emotion, that passion. Where else do you get that besides sports?